it seems like the world is crazier and crazier every day. Now they're not just burning flags, they're burning Bibles. And I was reading on this, I like these little books, but this, this one, but, uh, Jeremiah, and I was hoping him, but Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations while watching Jerusalem be destroyed by Babylon. He wanted them, but they wouldn't listen. <laughs> from the body and to be present with the Lord. And I don't know how many of us have arrived at that verse yet. When Paul said, we're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Uh, we look forward to that time when we will be present with him, but 
We want to stay here as long as the Lord lets us, I'm sure. That's our human nature. First time we're full, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we're made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. I'm going to begin sharing a series of messages with you uh, using the subject, The Most Awesome Day in the Life of Humanity. And that is the day when we stand before God in judgment. There are two separate judgments that are spoken of in the scriptures. One is the judgment seat of Christ for the Christian, and then there is the great white throne judgment for the non-Christian. And these are two separate judgments for two separate groups of people. Now, every individual, whether saved or lost, has two appointments. Every human being has an appointment with death. Hebrews 9, 27 says, And as it is appointed unto man, once to die. And the only way any one of us can escape death is for the rapture to occur. Otherwise, we will die. Humanity's death rate has a 100% uh, mortality rate, except for two. And that should not disturb us. Uh, we all know that this life is temporary. And many of us take that seriously. Of course, let's just be sure we've made the preparation that we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. And don't worry about death because you have eternal, everlasting life and you're not going to die. We're going to move, but we're not going to die. But many of us take the fact seriously that we're going to die. And yet multitudes think little of the second appointment that we have. You see, our first appointment is with death. Every one of us, whether saved or lost, will die, but every one of us will stand before God in judgment, whether we are saved or lost. And like I say, uh, there are two, uh, two different judgments, one for the saved and one for the unsaved. But today I want to focus upon the judgment seat of Christ, the judgment of the Christian. The most solemn day in the life of humanity, the most awesome day that we will ever face, will be the day when we stand before our Lord in judgment. I don't know of any scripture that should comfort us, that should confront us, that should challenge us than this scripture that I've read today. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, which is the judgment of the Christian, is not to determine whether we're saved or lost, but rather it will be the judging or the rewarding of the deeds done in this life. This judgment has to do with the receiving or losing of rewards. This judgment has to do with the stewardship of our life as a believer. Now you might say, well I don't care whether I receive any rewards in heaven or not. Some say, and I've heard it said, just as long as I get through the gate, that's all that matters to me. But if you do not receive any rewards in heaven, this will mean that you have lived a wasted life in this world as a Christian. 
It means that your life, since you were saved, has counted for nothing if there are no rewards, if you receive no rewards in heaven. Now, I said that the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment to determine whether we're saved or lost because, you see, that is already determined. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. So right now, you either have everlasting life or you do not. John 3, 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So whether you believe in and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior determines whether you go to heaven or to hell. Not whether you join a church, not whether you've been baptized, but whether you've been born again. And so right now, every person is saved or lost. Right now, you are on your way to heaven or to hell. Right now, you are traveling the broad road that leads to destruction or the straight and narrow road that leads to life. And so those who confess and repent of their sins and receive Jesus Christ as Savior are saved. And those who reject Jesus Christ as Savior are lost. And that is our present condition. You're not in between this morning. Each and every one of us is either on God's side or on Satan's side. It depends on what you have done with Jesus Christ. Your name is either written in the Lamb's Book of Life or it is not. And so uh, when you die, at the moment of death, your soul goes immediately either to heaven or to hell. Amen. And uh, I know that's uh, pretty straightforward, but that's not something you don't know. It's something we don't think about or like to talk about. But you see, each one of us this morning are but, if you're lost, if a person is lost, they are but one breath, but one heartbeat, but one step between them and heaven. If we're saved, we are but one breath, one heartbeat, one step between us and heaven. Because when death comes, we go immediately to the place for which we are prepared. And I shared last Sunday, I think it was, uh, with you examples uh, uh, in verifying that truth. The rich man in Lazarus is a good example of that. The rich man was in hell, but he had five brothers still here on earth, and he was saying, send uh, Lazarus, and he, uh, or send somebody to come witness to my brothers, lest they also come to this place. I gave you the example of Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, the repentant thief and others. And so what I'm saying is that there will not be any judgment to determine whether a person is saved or lost because you've all, you determine that. And each of us this morning is saved or lost. So I want us to begin looking at the judgment seat of Christ. And this is the judgment of the believer. And I won't finish this today, but uh, this, is, this is some wonderful scripture to think about. First of all, the judgment seat of Christ is an appointed day. Acts 17 and 31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Romans 2 and 16 says, In the day that God shall judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Matthew 10, 15, the scripture talks about the day of judgment. Matthew eleven twenty two, 22, the day of judgment. Matthew 12, 36, the day of judgment. 
Mark 6 and 11, the day of judgment. And so the judgment seat of Christ for the believer and the white throne judgment for the unbeliever are dates set on God's calendar. You and I have an appointment. I heard about two men that were discussing heaven, and these two men were, uh, they loved golf. And uh, they were just wondering, would there be golf in heaven? And so they agreed that whichever died first, the other would try to get a word back to the, the one left behind, whether there's golf in heaven. So sure enough, one of them died. And a, a few days later, he got a word back to his friend on earth, and he said, well, I have good news and bad news. The friend said, well, give me the good news first. He said, well... The good news is there is golf in heaven. And he said, well, what's the bad news? He said, the bad news is that you're on docket to tee off next Saturday morning. <laughs> so, but we all have an appointment with death, and we all have an appointment with the judgment. Note also the time of this judgment. The judgment seat of Christ for the believer is not at the moment of death. You see, when you die, you, you're not ready to stand immediately before the judgment seat of Christ because all your works are not in. You follow me. Revelation 14 and 13 says, uh, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from his forth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Did you know that after you die, after I die, the influence of our life still lives on, either for good or bad? Hebrews 11 and verse 4 says, says, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. You see, after we die, we are still speaking. The influence of our life still lives on. Others are be, still being helped or hurt by the influence of our life. 2 Peter 1 and 15 says, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things in remembrance. Paul, or Peter is saying, after I'm gone, you remember the things that I am uh, saying to you. You see, the works of those in heaven are still following them. Did you know that Billy Graham's in heaven, but he's still preaching? And many others that, I, that I've known, and uh, J. Vernon McGee, Adrian Rogers, J. Harold Smith, and others who are in heaven, but you just turn on your radio or TV, and you can still hear them preaching. And so... Uh, the day of judgment for the Christian is not the day when you die because the influence, influence of your life is still living on. But that day will be the day of the rapture. The day of judgment for the Christian is the day of the rapture. Jesus said in Revelation 22 and 12, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according uh, to his deeds. Look at the sequence of events. Christ will come in the rapture. Randy was singing about that, and I preached on that last Sunday. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and through 17 describe what is going to happen when Jesus comes uh, for his people. And so the rapture is going to occur. The dead in Christ will rise with a new glorified body. 
The living saints will change and put on our new glorified body, and we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and then we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the stewardship of our life. Before we sit down to the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will stand before God to give an account of our life. We do not give an account of the life we live before we were saved. You see, a newborn baby has no past. And so when we are born again, we have no past. Those sins that we committed before we were saved, they are cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness. They are cast as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against us anymore. Those sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, many of those sins that we committed before we were saved may be left marks upon our life that we must live with the rest of our life. I, I often use the illustration uh, with a, an unsaved person, maybe who has had a car accident and lost a limb of their body, now, the Lord saves them, but he doesn't, he doesn't replace that limb of their body that they lost, maybe in that car accident or due to alcohol, drugs, whatever, uh, those limitations. And maybe many of us, maybe all of us are living with some limitations that happened before we were saved, but... When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, God forgave those sins. And those sins are cast behind us, and we will never have to face those sins. They are under the blood. But I will hurriedly say that we'll give an account of our life from the moment we're saved until the Lord takes us out of this world. We know the time of the judgment, but also the certainty of the judgment. Our scripture says in verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every orthodox faith believes in a final judgment. And no, we don't agree maybe on the details. And you and I here this morning, some of us might disagree on some of the details surrounding the end time events. But we all agree on the importance of a final judgment. We must, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. There is a possibility that we may bypass death if the rapture occurs. We who are saved are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But there is no possibility of bypassing the judgment. We must. Not a possibility, but a certainty. We must, not a probability, but, it, but a definite appointment with the judgment. There must be a day when right is vindicated and wrong is condemned. Through the ages, multitudes have been misjudged. Multitudes have been treated unjustly. Many have suffered unjustly. And in our lifetime, we've seen a lot of injustice. We've seen the guilty go free. And we've maybe seen the, uh, those who are not guilty <coughs> condemned. Based on public pressure or prejudice or politics or whatever, and you know, folks, multitudes of Christians have served faithfully with no recognition. Let me say to you, you may serve the Lord faithfully. And maybe nobody ever tells you they appreciate you or what you've done. Or maybe nobody knows what you've done. But God does. But there is a day when truth is going to be revealed. 
when right will prevail, when justice will be given, there is a day of rewarding when we stand before our Lord. I want to go one step farther. The all-inclusiveness of the judgment. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. At the present, I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone must appear, all without exception, all without excuse, will stand before the judgment. The strong, faithful, committed Christian will appear. The weak, unfaithful, uncommitted Christian will appear before the judgment. The preacher, the deacon, the teacher, the leader, the lay person, everyone will appear before the judgment. The one talented person, the ten talented person will appear. No amount of progress or holiness would exempt anyone and no amount of unworthiness will exempt any person. Everyone will appear before the judgment. The judgment seat of Christ is a personal matter that every one of us will appear. We will not stand before God in judgment as a body of believers, but as an individual. We will not give an account as a church family, but as an individual. Not as a family, but personally. Romans 14 and 12, so then it says, Romans 14 and 12 says, so then every one of us must give an account of himself to God. So the day of judgment is awaiting each one of us. Salvation is a personal matter and accountability is a personal matter. Folks, we need to live life in light of that truth. We must remember, you know, I can't go back and change yesterday, and you can't either. There's some guys we wish we could, don't we? But I'll tell you what we will do. We'll face yesterday again in the judgment. We'll give an account of our lives, and we should live every day in light of that day when we will stand before God to give an account of our life. And we all fail so much, don't we? But John said, these things I write unto you that you sin not. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And when we fail and come short, we take it to the Lord and ask Him to forgive us, to cleanse us, and we Move on serving the Lord. You can't go back and, and correct yesterday's mistakes, but we can try to live from, from today in light of that day when we will stand before Him to give an account of our life. And each one of us will have enough to give an account of. As we look at our life and the stewardship of our life, since we were saved. I look at my life and sometimes I think, well, I, I've given the Lord such, uh, so little. Sometimes our service is so poor. Sometimes our commitment is so lax. But folks, Jesus has done so much for us. I'm so thankful he made salvation possible. He forgives sin. He still forgives our sins. Let's walk with him every day. Let's trust him. Through the things we don't understand in life, just trust him. And in those times of discouragement, and, and the devil will tell you, 
Well, you're just missing out on all that the world has to offer you. Just live your life as you please. But folks, again, we'll face our life again. And I wonder, I wonder if when I'm gone and you're gone, what are people going to remember about us? When our name is mentioned, what will come to their mind? Will it be something positive that we have done? Something that has made a difference in their life? Will they still be encouraged when they think of the, the example that I've set or you have set before them? Let's live the life of that day when we will give an account of the life we lived since we were saved. We're going to have an invitation to him. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, Jesus stands ready to save to the uttermost those who come to him. If there's another step you want to take in your journey, if you want to come and kneel at these chairs or right where you are there will be somebody here who will pray with you or help you. I'm here if I, can, if I can help you. We're going to stand in just a moment and say, let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your marvelous, amazing grace. And Lord, help us to realize that you have an appointed day in which we will give an account before you for the stewardship of our life. May we live in light of that day. Lord, as we close our service this morning, if there's a step someone needs to take, and Lord, we all need to just make a fresh commitment to you to walk closer, to do more, to be a better person, Help us to make that commitment to you today. In Jesus' name.